lymph and lymph nodes specifically we'll talk about today. So we're going to look at flu or sorry blood composition and its function. So blood is a connective a fluid connective tissue. Whole blood is blood contained in the cardiovascular system. Peripheral blood, we're talking about whole blood circulating in blood vessels, which carries oxygen, nutrients, and waste materials. And plasma is the clear liquid in which cellular components are suspended, which of course together creates whole blood. When we look at blood being broken down here, and we'll talk about this a couple times because you guys often are taking blood samples, analyzing blood samples, and looking at different portions and different measures of the blood. So when we're looking at whole blood itself, we're looking at plasma, which is roughly 55% of the total blood, the buffy coat, which is white blood cells and platelets, which is typically about less than 1% of total blood, and then we have red blood cells, which is roughly 45% of total blood. There's definitely some species variation within that as well, within the percentages. So looking at the cellular components of blood, we have erythrocytes, which are red blood cells, leukocytes, which are white blood cells, including neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes, and then we have platelets. Diagnostic blood tests are routinely performed on sick animals. Whole blood samples are commonly obtained, and we do this, of course, through venipuncture. And then there's an anticoagulant within the blood tube itself that prevents the blood from clotting after it's removed from the body. Because we know that as a protective feature, if the blood is pooling at any point, either inside or outside the body, then typically what happens is platelets start to clump together along with little bits of fibrin, and they create clots, and they try to seal up that area that's bleeding out. So that's a protective feature, it's a good thing, but of course, if we're taking blood and we need to analyze the whole blood itself and not just a component of the blood, then it's challenging for us to analyze the blood if it's all clotted. So a lot of different tubes exist. We have green tubes which have lithium heparin in them as an anticoagulant, and then the purple tube in the background is EDTA, it's the lavender tube, that's a common uh, anticoagulant. The non-coagulated, or, or sorry, the coagulated blood, so the tubes that contain nothing, are the red top tubes, and they allow the blood to clot, and then we can spin the blood down and look at just the serum. So a couple different tubes, you guys will learn a lot more about this as you start looking into clinical pathology. Functions of the blood, we have transportation of oxygen, nutrients, waste products, hormones, and platelets. Regulation of body temperature, regulation of tissue fluid control, and blood pH. It's a huge defense system with white cell phagocytosis and platelets to help seal the body off. Hematopoiesis, we'll talk about. That's the creation of, of blood cells. We have erythropoiesis, thrombopoiesis, and leukopoiesis. Hematopoiesis overall talks to the production of all blood cells, and it's a continuous process throughout the animal's life. It occurs primarily in red bone marrow, and in adults, you'll find this in the skull, the ribs, the sternum, the vertebral column, the pelvis, and the proximal ends of the femurs. Less active bone marrow is the yellow bone marrow, and we know that over time that creates sort of fatty tissue and connective tissue. And then, of course, in young animals, the main hematopoietic area is their long bones, so their femurs, their humerus, etc., Sometimes as well, hematopoiesis will occur in the liver and the spleen, so especially during times of great need, so if the animal is hemorrhaging or if they have a chronic uh, condition that's destroying the red blood cells or white blood cells, then they'll start producing blood cells through their liver and their spleen. So just looking at the general flow of hematopoiesis, everything starts off as a stem cell, and then essentially they divide and start to decide what type of cell they're going to create. From there, you'll get into much more detail about precursors for re red blood cells, neutrophils, monocytes, eosinophils, platelets, and basophils as you go through clinical pathology. But just to note that they all stem from your generalized stem cell, and then through processes, they differentiate. One thing I'll draw your attention to here is the megakaryocyte, which we'll talk about when we discuss platelets. So erythropoiesis is the process of creating red blood cells. It has multiple maturation steps and the rate's controlled by hormones. So erythropoietin is released from cells in the kidney in response to hypoxia, so to low oxygen content in the blood. And don't forget that a lot of times too we see 
anemic patients with kidney disease or kidney disease and they have anemia as well, sort of a secondary anemia, because their kidneys aren't functioning. And if their kidneys aren't functioning appropriately, then they're not able to produce erythropoietin and therefore they're not able to necessarily produce the amount of red blood cells that they need to survive. So that's a good clinical link. Thrombopoiesis is the production of platelets, thrombocytes. It's a unipotential stem cell in bone marrow that differ differentiates into a megakaryocyte. And sorry, that should say large bone marrow cell. So it's this really huge multinucleated bone marrow cell. Pieces of the cytoplasm from the megakaryocytes are released into the peripheral blood as platelets. And the multinucleated megakaryocyte never leaves the bone marrow. In a healthy animal, it never leaves the bone marrow. So that's what a megakaryocyte looks like. So it's this huge precursor cell, many nuclei, which is abnormal for most cells in the body, and then little pieces of the cytoplasm are broken off, and that is what creates a platelet. It's kind of interesting. Leukopoiesis is the general term for formation of white blood cells. Three types of white blood cell production. There's granulopoiesis, lymphopoiesis, and monopoiesis. And then we'll talk about the cellular components of blood. We've got the red blood cells, the structure, function, lifespan, and destruction. We'll talk about some of these in varying capacities. So red blood cell is also known as the erythrocyte, also known as RBC. It's a highly specialized cell. The mature cell lacks a nucleus, mitochondria, and ribosomes. So this is why, don't forget, that red blood cells only last three to four months in general circulation, and then they're destroyed. They don't contain that uh, genetic information to pass on, and they don't contain the energy-producing mitochondria to keep them going. Don't mind the cats snoring in the background. Their appearance, non-nucleated, and they're these biconcave discs, so they kind of look like a frisbee. And they have this thinner central zone. So they end up with this sort of pallor, a little bit more pale area in the center of the red blood cells. And when we stain them, they stain red. So here's kind of looking at the front right through to the back of the red blood cell. And this is the red blood cell on its side. So blood itself is a living tissue even after it's taken from an animal. The red blood cells utilize plasma glucose for energy, and glucose can't be replenished in a tube after the RBCs use it. So it maintains itself as a living tissue, but of course, once it eats up its plasma glucose, then it, they can't continue to, to survive in that tube. The functions, the main function is to transport oxygen to tissues through the use of hemoglobin and transport carbon dioxide to the lungs. They also maintain cell shape and deformability. Lifespan of blood cells, so it's going to vary with each species. Mice, their red blood cells last roughly 20 to 30 days. Cats, 68 days. Dogs, 120 days, so that's three to four months is where we're getting at. Horses and sheep is about 150, and cows is about 160. The process of aging red blood cells is senescence. Enzyme activity decreases. Cell membrane loses deformability, so that ability to change, and or sorry, lack of change. But 1% of the cells are removed from circulation daily. And destruction, there's two forms. There's extravascular or intravascular. <coughs> extravascular hemolysis accounts for about 90% of senescent RBCs, so aging needing to be destroyed RBCs. The process RBCs are removed from circulation by macrophages, and don't forget that macrophages are generalized cells that like to phagocytize or eat foreign invaders or other materials. So they're removed from circulation by macrophages in the spleen, the cell membranes are ruptured, the hemoglobin is released, then that hemoglobin is degraded into amino acids, into iron, and into heme. And of course, the amino acids return to the liver, they're used to build more proteins, the iron's transported to the bone marrow, and it's recycled during erythropoiesis. So when they destroy a red blood cell, they're resorbing all of the nutrients that were lost through the destruction of that red blood cell. Then the heme is broken down into bilirubin, attaches to albumin, and goes to the liver. Bilirubin is conjugated to glucocuronic acid, or sorry, glucuronic acid, it's con and then conjugated bilirubin is excreted as bile pigment, pigment into the intestines. 
converted urobilogen by bacteria. Some urobilogen is reabsorbed, and some is excreted in urine as urobilin or in feces as stercobilin. So we talked about that in brief detail when we talked about the liver, and mainly, of course, that urobilin is responsible for the yellow color of urine, and stercobilin is responsible for the brown color in feces. So it's just depending on which path that bilirubin takes as to where it goes, if it's going to the intestinal system or through the urine or through the feces. Intravascular hemolysis is a bit different. It accounts for about 10% of senescent RBCs. The destruction takes place within the blood vessels. The process, the RBC membrane ruptures within a vessel. Hemoglobin is released directly into the bloodstream. Hemoglobin binds to protein in the plasma and it becomes haptoglobin. Travels to macrophages in the liver. Okay, little, little Kupfer cells in the liver, which are specialized macrophages that always stay in that organ. And it's processed as with extravascular hemolysis. So hemolysis, of course, is the breakdown of, um, of red blood cells, the lysis. Excess unconjugated hemoglobin is carried to the kidneys and eliminated in the urine. So then we get hemoglobinuria. So this is an example where on a, on a dipstick, on a urine dipstick, we'll see hemoglobinuria, which means that the hemoglobin is being broken down within the vascular space, so within the blood vessels itself. And this relates directly to certain medical illnesses. So certain disease processes will call it, cause this to happen in the actual vessels themselves. It's only 10%. So it shouldn't be more than that. So if we're getting an abundance of hemoglobin on the urine dip strip, uh, dip strip, then we're seeing hemoglobinuria, and that could be indicative of conditions like uh, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, which is a condition whereby, of course, the immune system is attacking its own red blood cells and destroying them in the vessels. So things that we look for on that urine dip strip. <clears throat> So our complete blood cell count, or sorry, complete blood count is something that you guys will do in abundance. You'll do tons of these as you work through your career as a registered vet tech. There's different uh, components to the, the complete blood count, and of course you'll go through them in great detail in clinical pathology. A couple that I'll draw your attention to is the PAX cell volume, which we measure through the use of a hematocrit or a microhematocrit tube. And it's the volume of packed red blood cells measured and expressed as a percent of total volume of blood. There are three layers, plasma, buffy coat, and red blood cells. So if we're looking at what we're actually measuring up, so right here on the bottom left is an example of a microhematocrit tube. So we fill it with blood, which is a skill in its own, but we fill it with blood and we pack one end with this kind of putty so that the blood doesn't escape the tube. We put it in a centrifuge, which spins it at a very, very high rate, very, very forceful, very, very fast, and it pushes all the red blood cells to one end and maintains the serum on the other end. So then, of course, we've got, this is the real life example. So here's our microhematocrit tube. This one looks a bit funny. So we've got red blood cells, a little bit of a white buffy coat, and then really clear serum. Normally the serum is slightly straw colored, and in this one, it's a completely lysed sample. So red blood cells that are packed, very few red blood cells, so that's a red flag that they're anemic. And then all this dark red serum means that the red blood cells have been lysed. So there's a lot of hemolysis going on. <clears throat> so then we take our tube, our microhematocrit tube, and we line it up with the top of the blood sample to the top of the stopper, and we measure the percentage that the red blood cells fall within. Okay, so that's our packed cell volume. Gives us an idea of how many red blood cells within a percentage of whole blood they have, which of course indicates whether they're normal or anemic. To a degree. And then we have further tests for anemia. Platelets. We'll look at some platelets. So they're also known as thrombocytes, and they're not complete cells. They're pieces of cytoplasm from giant multinucleated bone marrow cells, i.e. the megakaryocytes. Appearance on a blood smear, non-nucleated, round to oval in shape, clear cytoplasm, small blue to purple granules in the cytoplasm, and the size varies by species. Generally, they're almost always smaller than a red blood cell. Macroplatelets, however, are occasionally seen, so really giant platelets. And looking in the background here, nice red blood cells, blank space, and these are platelets, just kicking around. 
So the most important feature is for uh, hemostasis. So they create this platelet plug and they create stabilization of the plug. So they stop blood from flowing in that specific area. Clotting process involves platelet adhesion and then platelet aggression. Thrombin is formed. It converts fibrinogen to strands of fibrin. Fibrin attaches to the platelet surface and creates life's perfect own little band-aid. The absence of platelets, of course, can result in bleeding disorders, and lifespan of platelets is roughly five to seven days. Petechia, that word there, that's in bold, is the word I want to bring your attention to. It's small hemorrhages on the skin. So if we look at the picture that's in the background, this is the inner lip. So this is the mucous membranes inside the lip, the lips being lifted up, of a fairly large, probably old dog. <clears throat> I'm going to guess it's brachycephalic, looking at that set of dental. Um, chompers. So petechia, what we're looking at is tiny little hemorrhages on the skin. So there are these tiny, tiny little bruises. And this is something we always want to look for in an animal when we are doing a physical exam. So part of the regular physical exam. So what it indicates is that they have some sort of a clotting disorder. So there's something going on that's preventing their platelets from working. So they're getting these tiny little bleeds underneath the skin. This could be caused by a thrombocytopenia, so that sort of immune, immune mediated uh, thrombocytopenia, which is when the immune system is attacking our own platelets. Ehrlichiosis, which is a tick-borne disease, can cause this. Generalized clotting disorders, and then of course, if the animal ingested warfarin, maybe 24 hours ago or so, then warfarin causes uh, stoppage of the platelets working, so it'll create all this extra bleeding. So the liver produces thrombopoietin to regulate the number of circulating platelets. Macrophages remove old or damaged platelets from circulation. So that's sort of the process of platelets with a little sidetrack about petechia. Just a little bit more about petechia. We can see it anywhere on their skin. We don't generally see it in their sclera, um, but typically we notice it on their mucous membranes and then we'll search around their body to confirm it. So looking at this dog here, kind of looks like a shepherd. He's got petechia all on the inside of his pinna. And then this dog here, all over its belly. So common places are the mucous membranes of the mouth, the belly, like the abdomen, the ventral aspect of the abdomen, and the pinna of the ear. Common places to identify petechia. All right, white blood cells, we will go through. So white blood cells, also known as leukocytes or, R or WCBCs, Mature WBCs generally are larger than mature red blood cells. Five types are normally present in circulating blood. Neutrophils are responsible for phagocytosis and tissue cleanup. And generally, the white blood cells bounce between tissue and vessel. So they tend to go back and forth depending on their type, some more than others. Neutrophils definitely bounce between tissue and intravascular. Eosinophils are responsible for inflammatory response as well as phagocytosis. So eosinophils essentially come out with an antihistamine. If there's a huge histamine response, then you'll see eosinophils trying to produce some antihistamine effect. Basophils are the least phagocyt uh, phagocytic of the granulocytes. They, in their little granules, they contain histamine and they contain heparin. And they share some characteristics with tissue mast cells. Both of them contain immunoglobin E. So we'll talk about that later on in clinical pathology. But the ones that I just described are called granulocytes. So basophil, neutrophil, and eosinophil, they all have little granules in their cytoplasm. The agranulocytes are lymphocytes and monocytes, which we'll talk about shortly. So overall, the function of white blood cells is to provide defense for the body against foreign invaders. So phagocytosis and immunity are really important. They're produced in the bone marrow, and they use peripheral blood to travel to the site of activity. Each type has its own role. So I went through the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils. Those are the granulocytes. And then the agranulocytes, we have the white blood cells that don't contain specific staining granules in their cytoplasm. These include lymphocytes and monocytes. Lymphocytes, there's three different types of lymphocytes with individual functions that regulate the immune system. We have T lymphocytes, also known as T cells, which are responsible for cell-mediated immunity, and they're mostly in peripheral blood. 
We have B lymphocytes, or B cells, <clears throat> which you'll find in the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the lymph tissue overall. They're responsible for antibody production. And then we have the natural killer cells, which identify and kill virus-infected cells. So they kind of seek out and destroy. So all of these three cells working together in their specific areas of the body are responsible for a huge portion of our immune system. Monocytes are quite different. They participate in the inflammatory response. As soon as they jump out of the bloodstream, they're known as a macrophage. So they jump into the tissue and they start eating away. They start dissolving old neutrophils. They'll take on old red blood cells, bacteria, etc. And they can actually live in the tissue for more than 100 days, which is crazy. That's a long time. Tissue macrophages and monocytes overall, their main goal is to clean up cellular debris after an infection or inflammation clears up. So the neutrophils are typically the first ones on the scene. They're the ones actively trying to destroy the bacteria or the foreign invader. And then the monocytes come along to the tissue and they start cleaning up the mess. I'm going to jump on to the lymphatic system and talk about that a little bit here and there, especially in regard to the function and the location of some of the important parts. So the lymphatic system involves two separate parts of the animal's immune system. There's a system of ducts and fluid called lymph, and the system picks up fluid leaked from capillaries, and the lymph ducts carry the lymph fluid to blood vessels near the heart. The lymph is put back into the bloodstream and it carries on this role. There's then the system of lymphoid organs and tissues, including the lymph nodes, the spleen, the thymus, the tonsils, and gut-associated lymph tissue, i.e. GALT. So the functions of the lymphatic system are vast. We have removal of excess tissue, so the plasma diffusion is how cells receive some of the nutrients carried by the plasma. The fluid that enters the interstitial, or the tissue spaces, will eventually put back, be put back into circulation. Part of the fluid will be picked up directly by the capillaries in the tissues and enter the venous part of the cardiovascular system. Some of the fluid will enter lymphatic capillaries. If there's an inadequate lymph drainage to an area, then of course the tissue fluid, that interstitial fluid, can build up and cause edema. So that's excess fluid accumulation in any area. There are other causes of edema, of course, too, but they all equate or relate to an inadequate fluid drainage. So removal of excess tissue fluid has a, plays a huge role in animals. Huge role in animals. So then we have waste material transport. That tissue fluid, that interstitial fluid that enters the lymphatic capillaries will contain some of the waste materials from the tissue cells that will be carried to the blood by the lymph and eventually eliminated. Filtration of lymph, the interstitial or tissue fluid that enters the lymphatic capillaries will also contain microorganisms or cellular debris and other foreign material that must be removed from the lymph before it enters into the bloodstream. This occurs as lymph passes through those lymph nodes, which we'll talk about. So the lymphatic vessels pass through the lymph nodes and through that purpose or through that process, they, they filter the actual lymph fluid. And then of course we have protein transport. Some large proteins, especially enzymes, are transported into lymph, uh, in, tra sorry, transported in lymph to blood from their cells of origin. These proteins are too big to enter the venous circulation directly, so lymph has this great ability to pick up larger protein molecules than the venous capillaries can, and it, it puts them back into circulation. So it has this access to larger protein molecules that the, the regular capillaries just don't have. So this is how the lymphatic system is essentially set up in the body. It's this whole uh, network of, of ducts, so this whole chain-like network throughout the body, similar to venous circulation. And you'll notice that there are these little things called lymph nodes all throughout this circulatory system. So all of that lymph fluid has to pass through the lymph nodes in order to get filtered before it dumps that lymph back into blood circulation. Excess interstitial fluid is picked up by small lymph capillaries. Fluid enters and leaves the tissue spaces, spaces due to blood pressure and osmotic pressure. The lymph capillaries join together to form larger and larger lymph vessels, very similar to the blood capillaries, uh, they were that whole blood network. 
and utilization of one-way valves and body movements to propel lymph toward the heart. So it sounds very similar to venous circulation, and it is very similar to venous circulation. Lymph passes through at least one lymph node and picks up lymphocytes while also undergoing filtration. Macrophages in the lymph node remove the microorganisms, so that's the filtration that's happening. Lymph is then emptied into the vena cava just before the large vein enters into the heart. So then, of course, we know that once it goes into the vena cava, it's emptied into the right ventricle, and then, or sorry, into the right atrium, and then it's sent to the right ventricle, then to the lungs, and essentially it's going through that circulatory process. At this point, lymph has come full circle. It originated in plasma, and now it's been returned to plasma. So looking at the different lymphoid organs, we have primary and secondary. Primary include the thymus, and in some animals, the bursa of fabricus, and the pears patches. Secondary, we have the spleen, lymph nodes, and tonsils. So looking at the thymus, it's located in the cranial thoracic region, and it's most prominent in young animals. It produces mature T cells, which are those lymphocytes, from precursors sent directly from the bone marrow. Cells then leave the thymus and travel to secondary lymphoid tissue. It's important in simulating cell-mediated immune response. So if we're having a cell-mediated immune response and the thymus is not working appropriately, then it's not going to sell the, send out those mature T cells to help fight. So you can see here, uh, this image here, it's just identifying where it's located. And then a little bit more specific, it's just caudal to the thyroid um, in the cranial aspect of the thorax. Then we have the bursa, bursa of fabricus, which is found only in birds. It's a round sac located above their cloaca, which is, of course, that communal duct for both bowel movements and fecal, or sorry, and uh, urine passage. It's similar in structure and function to the thymus. And the pears patches are located in the wall of small intestine, and we also call it galt. The structure and functions vary among species, but they generally activate B cells to produce antibodies. So the gastrointestinal system, especially the small intestine, has a huge amount of lymphatic activity within it. Secondary lymph organs, we have the spleen, the lymph nodes, and the tonsils, and they will all enlarge in response to antigenic stimulation. So anytime there's a foreign invader, which is an antigen, and the body recognizes it as an antigen, then the tonsils, the lymph nodes, and the spleen will all enlarge to fight it off. Main function is to pr uh, trap and process antigens and mature lymphocytes that mediate immune responses. So it helps age the lymphocytes. The spleen is a tongue-shaped organ, and it actually looks like a tongue. It's so weird. In surgery, when you have an animal opened up, if you ever get to see the spleen, I'm telling you, it looks like a giant tongue. It's located on the left side of the abdomen, near the stomach, in simple stomached animals, and it's near the rumen in ruminants. It's the largest lymphoid organ in the body. The spleen is covered with a capsule of fibrous connective tissue and smooth muscle, Trabeculae from the capsule go into the soft tissue of the spleen and the smooth, the smooth muscle cells contract and squeeze blood out of the spleen and back into circulation. So if we look at an x-ray here, this is a pretty typical, just ignore the arrow, um, it's because somebody else's x-ray, but this is pretty typical x-ray except that the dog has a lot of gas in its stomach, maybe some rib bones, there's something going on there. But what I want to point out is just have a look at the spleen. Okay, look at the spleen here. And then likewise on another one, same thing, nice spleen. So that's the liver, that's the lobe of the liver, that's some fat, got large intestines, so the colon, small intestine, nice little spleen. So you can't always see the spleen on animals. Quite often if they're under anesthetic or undergoing a surgery, you will be able to see the spleen on x-ray because it gets enlarged, especially with a lot of anesthetics, it gets enlarged. But if you're looking for the spleen, a normal spleen looks like a taco shell, for real, see? taco shell. Okay, little thing to point out to keep in mind when you're looking at your x-rays. Spleen functions are to store red blood cells so in general, so blood storage in the red pulp of the spleen, removal of foreign material from circulation by tissue macrophages in the red pulp, removal of dead, dying, and abnormal red blood cells by the tissue macrophages in the red pulp, and of course lymphocyte cloning in the white pulp during an immune response. 
And here we go, it's divided into the white pulp and the red pulp, which you can see in this image here. I was just looking. I don't know if the textbook meant to make that and do a smiley face, but that's pretty funny. All right, and then the spleen acts as well as a reservoir for blood when the animal is at rest. The spleen gets larger when the storage spaces are filled with blood. When the body needs to, or when it needs access or it needs excess red blood cells, so it needs more red blood cells, then the trabeculae contract and the blood is squeezed back into circulation by the spleen. The spleen. So the spleen is kind of like this giant sponge that can just release its red blood cells and, and blood cells in general at any point. At that point, the spleen will get smaller. Now the spleen sounds really important, and it is really important, but it's not essential to life. So a lot of times as animals age, especially large dogs, they can get tumors on their spleen. And of course, an option, depending on the health of the animal and the likelihood that the tumor is going to spread or not, but surgery sometimes is an option. So animals can live without their spleens. This top image is a bit pixelated. That's an enlarged spleen. That's a giant enlarged spleen. And then likewise here, this is a spleen with a huge cancerous tumor on it. So sometimes they will perform surgery to remove the spleen if it's in poor health. But again, the owner always has to know or should know whether that splenic tumor is going to spread right? Because are we just buying that dog a couple days? Are we buying the dog a couple weeks? Or are we actually buying the dog a couple years? So a big thought, but the spleen definitely does get tumors and dogs and cats can live without their spleen. All right, the tonsils are nodules of lymphoid tissue that are not covered with a capsule. So if we think about the lymph nodes, they are definitely covered with a capsule. They're found in epithelial surfaces all over the body, most familiar in the pharyngeal area. So that's in the throat. There's others in the larynx, the intestine, the prepuce, and the vagina. The function is to prevent the spread of infection into the respiratory and the digestive systems. So they prevent the spread. Which, of course, if you're fighting a sore throat, if you're fighting a bacteria in your throat, your tonsils will get enlarged because suddenly they're active. And then we have gut-associated lymph tissue which is GALT. It's lymphoid tissue found in the intestinal mucosa and submucosa, and I mentioned that part before, and of course GALT is classified as both central and peripheral lymphoid tissue. So it's a funky one. We'll talk about this a lot uh, later on in sort of the more advanced clinical pathology, but the GALT has a lot to do with immunity, and the GALT definitely sends out certain types of lymphocytes as it goes through its processes of fighting off antigens. And then we have peripheral lymph nodes, which are really important to talk about because we always want to palpate these on a, during physical exam. So our dogs and cats especially, horses a lot of times too, will palpate certain lymph nodes to see their health. But lymph nodes, if we remember that lymph fluid in its vessel passes through lymph nodes to undergo filtering. And that's through macrophages in the lymph nodes that eat away all the antigens or foreign invaders. So when lymph nodes are swollen, it could mean that there's localized bacteria or virus in that area. So if we think about it, an animal with really poor dental disease quite often has swollen mandibular lymph nodes because continuously those lymph nodes that are really close to their throat and their mouth are filtering that huge amount of bacteria that's coming from their body as they swallow uh, fluid to go into their digestive tract. So swollen lymph nodes can tell us a lot about the animal. Unfortunately, sometimes also swollen, swollen lymph nodes are indicative of things like lymphoma. Not ideal. But this is why we need to palpate them to know what is normal and what is abnormal or enlarged. So looking at our dogs and cats, the mandibular, prescapular, and popliteal are palpable in normal dogs and cats. And the axillary and inguinal are typically only palp palpable if they're enlarged. And this is the location of them all. So parotid is the one that we often feel in the horse. And it's kind of just, uh, just caudal to their temporal mandibular joint, sort of like caudal dorsal to their temporal mandibular joint. The ones that we almost always feel in dogs and cats are the submandibular, which are on the left and right side, just caudal to the base of their mandible as well as the popliteal, which is just proximal to their hawk, so to their calcaneus. So those ones definitely want to get to know. I do recommend you guys starting to practice. 
on dogs and cats. You can always practice on your own dogs and cats at home as well. Cats, normal lim uh, mandibular or popliteal lymph nodes are at most the size of a pea, like maybe even a soybean. They're really, really tiny. Dogs, it depends on the size of the dog. Like a St. Bernard, they'll probably have grape size lymph nodes. And then, of course, a chihuahua is closer to a cat. So they vary. You just need to know what's normal for that specific size of animal. When we palpate them, we palpate simultaneously with the index and the thumb. And it's important to note which ones are enlarged. So is it just mandibular, which might result in just it being dental disease, or is it everywhere? Because if they have enlarged lymph nodes all over the body, that's much more of a concern than, let's say, just enlarged lymph nodes in the mandibular region. Definitely have a practice of this. So here we can see that she's palpating the axillary just in the armpit of the two front legs. And back here, just proximal to the hawk or the calcaneus, she's palpating the popliteal. So this dog here has an evidently swollen lymph node. Doesn't always mean cancer. Could mean local reactivity. It could mean that that specific lymph node is fighting off a bacteria or a virus. Could also mean lymphoma, right? Lots of different reasons. So you'd want to notice that on physical exam. And then this horse here has drainage of lymph nodes. So infected lymph nodes that are then draining. Not ideal. Things we want to notice. So we know that lymph flows through these little lymphatic vessels and of course it connects to lymph nodes in order to undergo phagocytosis and get rid of any foreign invaders. Lymph itself, so the lymph fluid, starts out as, an, as excess tissue fluid. Capillaries in tissue, flu, er, sorry, in tissue join to form larger vessels to propel the lymph forward toward the heart and lymph eventually joins the bloodstream. So it's taken from the bloodstream, it gets filtered through, and then it's put back in the bloodstream. Those lymph nodes that I was talking about, they're small little kidney bean shaped filters along the lymphatic vessels. They trap antigens, like I said. Two sections, they have a cortex and the medulla, similar to that of the kidney. They're found throughout the body, so we have some that are palpable, as I mentioned, and then others that you don't palpate, but you might see abnormalities with during surgery, such as the mesenteric lymph nodes, and they drain organs in their associated locations. They can give a clue to the health of the animal. Nodes more easily palpated when enlarged in response to antigenic stimulation. And of course, in order to identify what's actually happening within that lymph node, we'll typically perform a fine needle aspirate, where we take a needle or needle and syringe, enter into the lymph node, draw back some of the fluid or the cells, and then look at it under, uh, under a microscope on a, on a slide to see what cells are going on. Are they normal or are they abnormal? And then just a little thing here about tonsils versus lymph nodes and the differences. Tonsils are found close to the moist epithelial surfaces. They're found at the beginning of lymph drainage systems. There's no capsule to tonsils. Lymph nodes are found all along the lymph vessels, all throughout the bodies or the body as a whole, and they definitely have a capsule. And that is it.